Chers auditeurs, Dear listeners, bonjour. Welcome in Comdarchi Podcast Season 4. Saison 4 dans le monde fascinant des architectes. And in the architectural projects. Je suis Anne Charlotte de Ponte, passionnée d'architecture et docteur des universités en histoire de l'archi. I am one of the spokespersons of Anne Charlotte, who is a PhD in architecture history. Merci. Thank you. D'être avec moi aujourd'hui. To be with us today. Et and maintenant, now, lundi en français, place au talent. And Wednesday, let's talk projects. In English, of course. Bienvenue dans Comme d'Archi. Dear listeners, hello and welcome to our summer series in season 4 of Comme d'Archi. Today, after our customary little bit of perspective, we're going to tell you about a magical fairy tale castle, Chenonceau also known as the Château des Dames, the Ladies' Castle, based on a two-part summary written by Anne Charlotte. This is Estelle for Anne Charlotte. Did you know that Chenonceau is one of France's top three most visited castles alongside Versailles and Chambord? Did you know that it's still privately owned? Personally, I'm delighted. Because when private owners are passionate, courageous, erudite, generous and respectful, they take on the role of guardians of these buildings, demonstrating by this example that the soul of the buildings is maintained better than ever by their care. Finally, in addition to the public policies, which are certainly indispensable, but which have the danger of leveling down. As for the private sector, when it is responsible, it is there, agile, armed with its pilgrim staff. It gets up at the crack of dawn every morning, resurrecting the soul of buildings. By the way, thank you, Monsieur Bern, for your passionate, untypical fight, which also proves that, wherever it comes from, regardless of labels, any battle well fought can help us move forward. It's interesting to note that the Inventaire Général, the French state institution in charge of identifying, studying and making known the elements of heritage that are worthwhile, emphasized on page 9 in Principe, Méthode et Conduite de l'Inventaire Général, published by Édition du Patrimoine in 2001, and I quote, The cultural value of a heritage asset is not given a priori, It is conferred by the knowledge and perception we have of it, which are themselves evolving. In France, the notion of patrimoine, like that of heritage in the UK and beni culturali in Italy, has expanded rapidly in recent years to encompass all aspects of past production. It's not just a question of going out into the field to recognize a heritage that is already there, and changing from its origins and indisputably identifiable as such, but of building up a possible corpus of objects to which a cultural value is attached and renewing our knowledge of those we thought we knew. End of quote. Fortunately, institutional figures still carry this spirit. But until when? When I hear, for example, from an erudite Kamdashi listener, that voices from the Americas have decided to destroy all European organs? Ah, oh, that is no good style stupidity from the French is no good comics, coupled with acculturation. Let the enraged well from across the seas, by the way, who'd have thought a well could get so enraged, start by dropping his phone and visiting libraries, the real ones, with their staircases, lecterns, ladders, shelves, creaking wood, and so on. Let him begin by testing his patience, referencing, checking and ordering his sources, then confronting them with reasoning in the time of handwriting. Now that's durable. Like Chenonceau. So, what does Chenonceau have to tell us over the years? Aside from the fact that it was built by audacious, ambitious women throughout history. The subject of this first episode women who overcame obstacles, circumvented stupidity and put their minds to work. The female voice of the present day, ah, oh, the female voice of the present day, 
yet somehow so legitimate in view of the facts, all too often carried here by a dogmatic ideology, fed by stodgy cliches, carried away by pithy rhetoric, discredited by its violence, prey to tragic comedy, a pale copy of the mannequin worm that powerful planetary politics wants us to swallow. This female voice, therefore submissive, submitted to the logic of the East No Good level, should learn from the Shenosos women. Fighting is a path, and if we remain silent in the face of so many surreal situations today, what will become of our imperfect yet coveted world tomorrow? Let's be honest for once. <laughs> Flaubert said that Chenonceau had no blood on its walls. Thanks to these women, who were they? In parenthesis, I dedicate this passage to my daughters and daughters-in-law and tell them, in passing, that while collective work is powerful, leveling down does not work. If the Château de Chenonceau is nicknamed the Château des Dames, the Ladies' Castle, it's because these women have lived there worked and protected it for four centuries. Let's discover these singular, imperfect personalities through the castle's history and building campaigns. Although the Chenonso estate is first mentioned in the 11th century, the history of the residence begins in the 13th century. The thief belonged to a certain Jean-Marc who was accused of sedition, i.e. concerted revolt against established authority, and had his castle burned down in 1412. But he rebuilt it, adding a fortified mill, all delivered around 1430. Burned with debt, his heir, Pierre-Marc, sold the property to Thomas Boyer in 1513. Thomas Boyer was the receiver of finances for King Charles VIII of France and later for Louis XII and finally François I. Thomas Boyer decided to demolish a large part of the property, including the mill and castle, and rebuild it, leaving only the original keep, the Mag Tower. The work lasted almost 10 years, starting in 1515. It was Thomas Boyer's wife, Catherine Brissonnet, the first woman of Chenonceau, who oversaw the reconstruction. She became the mistress of the place, taking pleasure in inviting the French nobility. In turn, she was a professional site supervisor and hostess. François Ier visited twice, but Thomas Boyer's son, the heir, failed to honor a debt he had contracted with the French crown. Robelot, yet again. François Ier seized the castle in 1535. When the king died in 1547, his son Henri II inherited the castle, offering it to his mistress, Jeanne de Poitiers, as a gift of love. The latter became very attached to it. An unrivaled horsewoman, she built the bridge around 1550 using the cofferdam technique to cross the Cher a tributary of the Loire River. She added vegetable gardens and orchards, as well as French-style gardens, including a terraced garden surrounded by walls to protect against flooding. Diane, horsewoman, haughty and visionary landscape gardener, enjoyed this paradise until 1559, when the king died accidentally in a tournament. His widow, Catherine de Medici, took advantage of the situation to seize the castle in revenge, forcing Diane to leave for Chaumont. Catherine de Medici, now regent of France, in the manner of the Ponte Vecchio in her native Florence, pursued the gallery project above the bridge over the Cher in a more ambitious version than her predecessors had thought of, as we shall see later. What could be better than a gigantic Italian Renaissance-inspired gallery to host spectacular parties? 
Unstoppable Catherine, a great builder, added new spaces between the chapel and the library and a service wing near the entrance courtyard. She also added gardens. Had she not died in 1579, the castle would be a gigantic estate today, as evidenced by a project abandoned after her death. The beautiful residence was entrusted to Louise de Lorraine Vaudemont, granddaughter of Catherine de Medici, Queen of France, and wife of Henri III. Henri III was soon assassinated. Louise never recovered, dressing rooms in black in the castle that had become a sanctuary. A princess's castle transformed into a vast dwelling of infinite mourning. Louise's nièce, the wife of the Duc de Vendôme, was then entrusted with the castle. For a hundred years, it remained in the family line with almost no stir. It fell into the hands of the Duc de Bourbon in 1720, was plundered for Versailles and abandoned by the Bourbon in a state of ruin, before being bought back in 1733 by the wealthy squire Claude Dupin. His wife, another Louise, endowed with many qualities, both financial and physical, and above all, cultural and intellectual, rekindled the flame, bringing in the brilliant minds of her time, Voltaire, Montesquieu, Buffon, Marivaux. In extremis, she saved the castle from destruction during the French Revolution, arguing that it was the only bridge within easy reach of the town. 1864. Marguerite Pelouse, a wealthy heiress from the industrial bourgeoisie, buys the castle. She commissioned architect Félix Roguet to restore it to the splendor of Diane de Poitiers' time. She spent lavishly on the restoration. A dark political affair led her to ruin, and the castle was finally seized and resold in 1891 to a Cuban millionaire who promptly sold it to his own nephew, who in turn sold it to the Meunier family, makers of chocolates of the same name. The year was 1913. The Meunier family are still the worthy owners today. Phew, the name Waltz has come to a halt. During the First World War, Far from the trenches, Simon Meunier administered the hospital set up in the castle's two galleries. More than 2,000 wounded were cared for until the end of the war. For several decades, Bernard Voisin, an agronomist by training, was entrusted by the family with the task of preserving this heritage that had become a cultural enterprise. We thought that Marguerite Pelouse would be the last woman to save the castle that Simone Meunier would be the last woman to work there in resilience. But we didn't count on Laure Meunier, wife of Jean-Louis Meunier, nicknamed the Dragon of the Loire, who has been the sole director since 2002. A patron of the arts, a woman of her time, with a modern and valiant spirit. Personally, I wish there were more dragon in the Loire. Perhaps tomorrow so that the magic of the building, rebuilt by Thomas Boyer from 1515 onwards, can live on. Dear listeners, thank you for tuning in. Let's meet again next week for the continuation of our story on Chenonceau, Chenonceau versus construction and styles. Until then, take care. Goodbye. Thank you for listening. Thanks to Julien Robourg, sound engineer, who is collaborating with us today. Don't forget to tune in to our previews on Instagram at Comme d'Archi Podcast. If you enjoy this podcast, don't hesitate to promote it by giving it five stars and a little comment on Apple Podcast or on your favorite podcast platform. And above all, subscribe to listen to all of our episodes for free. See you soon, and until then, take care of yourself.